is the DMCA Revisited, What's Fair, and we are very lucky to have with us today the two House co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus, Congressman Goodlad and Congressman Bauscher, both from uh, Virginia. And Congressman Goodlad is the co-chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus, as I mentioned. He also serves on the Judiciary Committee. He is vice chair of the Subcommittee on Courts, the Internet, and Intellectual Property. He is also the chair of the Agriculture Committee, which also has a lot of intersection with intellectual property issues um, since the advent of biotechnology. And welcome. Tim, thank you very much, and, and thank all of you for turning out today. This is a great panel discussion today, and this is one that's really uh, a, a very important issue and one of which there's a diversity of opinion, as you will soon find out. Um, Rick and I uh, have worked together as co-chairs of the Internet Caucus uh, uh, on a great many issues in which we have uh, concurred and moved forward uh, in the same direction, and we are, in fact, doing that in a number of areas. But this is one where we have some difference of opinion, and so I think it's great for you have the opportunity to hear from uh, a very distinguished panel that will give you that uh, diverse opinion. America is the world's largest creator, producer, and exporter of copyrighted materials. Intellectual property is our greatest export, comprising more than 5% of the gross domestic product and creating new jobs at three times the rate of the rest of the economy. However, this vibrant sector of the U.S. economy is at great risk due to widespread piracy, the unauthorized reproduction, distribution, and sale of U.S.-made movies, music, software, video games, and other creative works. The motion picture industry alone estimates losses due to global piracy amount to $3.5 billion annually, not including illegal downloading. With the passage of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in 1998, Congress worked hard to achieve a balance that promotes the interests of both copyright owners and the consumers who use their works. The DMCA encourages the availability to consumers of works in the digital environment by prohibiting the trafficking in hacking tools that disable the technical pr protections that copyright owners rely on to prevent the mass reproduction of their creative works. A number of safeguards were included within the DMCA in order to ensure on a continuing basis that legal uses of copyrighted works were not adversely affected. Consumer groups have advocated for legitimate market-driven options for renting, purchasing, or even copying content. And with the advent of iTunes and other popular innovations, great progress has been made. However, these options will never fully materialize if the circumvention of technology that provides these consumer choices is legalized. Businesses will simply stop rolling out new and innovative technologies if they are not sure that their works will be protected. We need to encourage, not discourage, the massive investment that is now ongoing in expensive technologies to safely distribute products digitally to consumers in ways never before possible. Therefore, I urge the Congress to, pro to be very cautious about opening up the DMCA and upsetting the balance that we achieved in 1998. While we need to ensure that the DMCA is doing its job and is sufficient to protect copyrighted works, I am concerned about legislative proposals that would create loopholes in the law that would ex weaken existing copyright protections. I look forward to hearing from today's panelists, although I'm going to miss most of it because I've got to be at another lunch and therefore must cede the field to my good friend and colleague, Rick Boucher, who will share with you uh, a somewhat different perspective, although we work constantly to try to find common ground on this issue as well as others. Please, uh, you want me to introduce him or are you going to take care of that? I, I had something prepared. Okay, you do it. <laughs> I worked really hard last night. <laughs> uh, Congressman Rick Boucher, as Thanks. Congressman Goodlatte. Thank you, Congressman. Congressman Boucher is also co-chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus and a founding member. He serves on both the Judiciary Committee and the Commerce Committee in the House, a unique vantage point to work on technology and Internet issues. Um, he is actually the only, the only member of the House to actually have um, those two committee appointments. In the 102nd Congress, Congressman Boucher led the introduction of legislation that ultimately allowed commercial content uh, on the Internet and also freed the Internet from government control. Um, he is also the principal author of the Digital Media Consumers Rights Act um, of 2003, H.R. 107, which really forms the framework for the debate today. Uh, Congressman Boucher. Well, Tim, thank you uh, very much. And I want to express my appreciation to the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee 
for hosting this forum, and in fact for all of the work that the committee does throughout the course of every year in hosting a variety of forums on information technology policy challenges so that the people who will make these decisions in the Congress have an opportunity to hear about the pros and the cons uh, of all of the uh, various choices uh, that uh, are presented with regard to these matters. Uh, the caucus uh, advisory committee performs an invaluable function, and I want to say uh, thank you today to Tim uh, and to the others who administer the caucus uh, and to the many companies who participate in it. I also want uh, to commend the work of my good friend and colleague and, uh, in fact, my Virginia colleague, uh, Bob Goodlatte. Both of us represent Virginia. We represent adjoining congressional districts. Uh, we have the privilege of being the two House co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus. Uh, and it is, as Bob indicated, a rare day when we have uh, diverging views on these policy matters. We are both Internet advocates. We both uh, believe that Congress should get out of the way to the greatest extent possible and allow the Internet to operate in a globus, global and seamless way. We encourage the delivery of a wide variety of content uh, across uh, the Internet. And we've been champions together in these causes uh, for many years, and that continues. Uh, we do have uh, diverging points of view with regard to the issue that is presented today. And I want to take just a moment at the outset of the conversation to suggest three principles. These are principles which uh, perhaps uh, our panelists can comment on. They are principles that you might want to ask questions about when the time for questions arrives. And they are simple uh, and I think straightforward. First of all, I believe that fair use should exist for digital media just as it has existed in the analog era. The 1998 Digital Millennium Copyright Act cedes to the creator of content the authority at the creator's will to extinguish fair use with respect to digital media. The law allows that by saying that the content creator can enshroud the digital media with a technology protection measure and then the law says that it is a federal offense to circumvent that technical protection measure, even if you do so for a lawful purpose, even if you do so in order to exercise your fair use right, uh, to make a backup copy, uh, to skip the commercials at the beginning of a DVD, to excerpt a small amount of material from a DVD in order to make uh, a video book report or movie report, as the case may be. Uh, in order to play the DVD that you have rented at the video store on your Linux-based computer operating system. If you want to do any of these things, you have to bypass technical protection. All of these things are lawful, but under the law, if you bypass technical protection to exercise those fair use rights, you have committed a federal offense. Now, the bill that I have introduced would say that you can bypass technical protection in order to exercise a lawful right you can read that to exercise a fair use right. My point in mentioning this principle is that while these examples are pretty obvious, the potential of the DMCA goes much further. And it basically says that if the creator of content wants to do so, he can enshroud all of his digital media with a technical protection measure and then only permit access to it on such terms as he deems are acceptable. And that could be the making of a micropayment for every access or perhaps denying access altogether in certain circumstances. And if that power is exercised to its fullest, and the law allows it today, fair use can and perhaps will be extinguished completely with respect to digital media. So my first principle is fair use should continue to apply in the digital age. The second principle that I would put forward is that fair use should not be secondary in priority or in status in the law to the rights of the creators of intellectual property. Historically, fair use, at least in the analog era, has always resided coincident with the rights of the creators of content. And it has a status in Section 107 of the Copyright Act that gives it a dignity in the law equal to the rights of the creators of content. But you will hear from the content industry that fair use can only be tolerated with regard to digital media if first there is assurance that through technical protection 
intellectual property rights are protected. And then they will tell you that there's no way to code for fair use. And in saying that, they happen to be right, because fair use is a flexible concept. The statute sets forth a variety of factors that a judge will consider in determining whether a particular application is fair use. And so it is a principle that can grow and, and apply to new circumstances over time. And there's no way that you can write code that would permit circumvention just to achieve what the state of the law at that moment would declare to be a fair use purpose. And since that uh, potential and that ability doesn't exist, the answer of the content creating community is no circumvention for any reason, even for a lawful reason, even to protect fair use. I would suggest that that's a radical concept. And our law has never accommodated prior to 1998 that kind of principle, and it should not going forward. The third principle I would share with you today is that the Betamax decision of the Supreme Court in the mid-1980s is good law. It has withstood the test of time. It gave birth to the home recording industry, which has dramatically enriched the American economy and enriched the lives of the consumers of media in the analog era. And that law should apply going forward. This was the Supreme Court decision that many regard as the preeminent fair use decision of the Supreme Court. In that case, the Supreme Court held that the Sony Corporation, which had created the first VCR, known as the Betamax, I'm old enough to remember the Betamax, I actually had one, that was my first VCR, but the court said that uh, Sony was not accountable for contributory infringement because the Betamax could be used in order to make illegal copies and infringe copyright. The court announced a very important principle, and that is that if the device is capable of substantial, non-infringing use, and in this case, uh, that use was time-shifting of broadcast television programming, then the manufacturer of the technology is not accountable for contributory infringement. That doctrine provided legal certainty. That legal certainty has given confidence to the home recording industry manufacturing, and that industry has thrived in America, and because it's thrived in America around the world, as a consequence of the legal certainty of that decision. In 1998, that decision was overruled insofar as circumvention devices are concerned by the statutory provisions of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which created a new standard. The manufacturer of circumvention technologies, those that enable the circumvention of technical protection measures, will be judged based upon his intent at the time that he introduced the product. No longer can he simply point to a substantial non-infringing use and say my technology should be fine based on that. The question becomes what was his intent at the time he manufactured. And he can have the best intent in the world, but he will have no legal certainty in being certain that a jury 20 years from now is not going to find that his intent was contrary to what it actually was at the time he introduced that product into commerce. A jury 20 years later could say, well, look, this device has been put to a lot of infringing use. So that must have been your intent at the time that you introduced it as a new product. And so the lawyer for that CEO is going to say, it's a great product. Mr. Chairman, it's a great idea to put this into commerce, but I'm going to advise you not to do it because you could be sued successfully 20 years from now without regard to what your real intent is. I think, and I, my bill provides, that Betamax, which has withstood the test of time, should be reestablished as the principal offering legal certainty for the manufacturers of these devices as well. Those are the three principles. And I appreciate your interest in the overall subject, and I wish for you today a very successful conversation. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much, Congressman. And um, first, let me introduce our panel. I'll go through them all together and then ask them to make their um, brief comments. I want to apologize all of them publicly for cramming them into a very, very small table and apologize to all of you. It, it's a close-knit community. <laughs> so um, with further ado, 
Michael, uh, first want to introduce Fred Von Lohman from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, Fred is an attorney. He's been advocating for the balancing of fair use with copyright law for a long time now. Um, he has also been very involved in copyright litigation, EFF. The Electronic Frontier Foundation is, um, represents uh, many, many persons um, uh, in litigation uh, with uh, large media companies. Um, next, we'll go to David Green from the Motion Picture Association. David is also a lawyer, and before joining MPAA, he held a very senior position at the Department of Justice's Computer Crimes and Intellectual Property Division. So in a sense, he's also a, a former cop, if that, that can be said. Um, number three, Michael Petricone. Michael is with the Consumer Electronics Association, which is a large trade association that represents over 1,000 manufacturers of audio, video, accessories, mobile electronics, communication, information, multimedia products, etc. Um, he is also a lawyer and manages the CEA's Government and Legal Affairs Department. And for a refreshing change, uh, we have a non-lawyer and a, 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 a businessman technologist on the panel, Jonathan Zuck. And Jonathan is with the Association for Competitive Technology, which is a trade association um, of which Jonathan is a uh, president. Uh, which advocates on behalf of small and medium-sized entrepreneurial technology companies. Uh, before joining uh, ACT as its president, uh, Jonathan's been involved in a variety of um, technology startups and established companies in the technology business space. Um, Congressman, Congressman Bauscher and Congressman Goodlatte pretty much covered the, the territory of what we're here to discuss today, as you can uh, pretty much have gathered. Uh, we're here to talk about the Digital Marketing Copyright Act and some of the proposals, particularly one proposal, uh, to open it back up. Um, one thing that uh, I'd like to just to make sure we're clear on is that um, the Digital Modern and Copyright Act um, prohibits the circumvention of technological measures. It also prohibits the distribution and manufacture of tools um, that would um, break those digital locks in a sense. Um, proponents of the, the DMCA argue that there is a, a safety valve uh, built into this process. It allows for a triennial, triennial review by the Library of Congress's Copyright Office. And this triennial review um, allows them, is in, they're empowered to grant specific exceptions uh, for circumvention. Um, is my understanding that it doesn't allow for exemptions for distributing um, tools that would break um, digital locks, but that's the finer point. Um, there are four exemptions been granted by the Copyright Office thus far, and I think there are some cop um, Library of Congress attorneys in the room, so please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and, and these exemptions are for things like um, breaking the locks on internet content filtering programs, um, obsolete computer and video game programs, and um, for access to read aloud features of your ebooks and and, and, and and things of that nature. Um, so um, proponents of the DMCA um, feel that it's absolutely vital to preventing massive piracy, um, to preserving the regulatory environment that would be stable enough um, for their businesses and their content to thrive in, in a variety of digital forms. Um, and that's worth repeating. Um, the specific language in uh, HR 107, which really kind of frames the discussion today, um, says that it is not a violation of this section to circumvent a technological measure in connection with access to or the use of a work if such protection does not result in infringement of the copyright in the work. And it shall not be a violation of this title to manufacture, distribute, or make non-infringing uses of hardware or software product capable of enabling significant non-infringing use of a copyrighted work. Um, so that pretty much, um, I think Congressman Bowser could say that off the top of his head, but I had to read it, I apologize. Um, but if, if we can just go to the panelists now and ask them to have maybe three to five minutes at the most opening comments, and then we can engage in kind of a moderated discussion. I would encourage you during the question and answer period to have your questions ready. Feel free to raise your hand. I'll call on you in turn. Or there are sh little white note sheets on your, on your tables that you can also write, scribble down a question. Megan and Vanessa in the back with these white name tags can come around and pick them up, and, and, and I'll read the question to the panel if you'd prefer doing it that way. Um, and, and I also really want to direct your attention to the one-pagers that were handed out before you came in. The advisory committee is over 200 organizations in the private sector that have kind of got together to assure that there's some informed decision-making and provide their expertise when called upon. We called upon them to write these one-pagers for you so that we could um, gather them, compile them, and give them to you so you can get a perspective of where some of the or big organizations are uh, and the important organizations are with regard to this issue. And, and there's some really good content in here, so I encourage you to read them. And it's a quick read. They're one-pagers. So first, Fred, as a, a, a public interest advocate from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, why do you support HR 107, and um, why should people care? Great. Uh, 
That's a big question. Uh, I, I'm tempted to answer by saying for all the reasons Congressman Boucher mentioned. Uh, but let me add a little more context to that. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has been engaged uh, in this debate since the DMCA, well, bef since before the DMCA became law, but certainly since that time, uh, we've been involved in virtually every civil lawsuit involving the DMCA that has been brought in the last five years. Uh, we've also been involved in uh, some of the criminal actions as well. We've been involved in both of the uh, Copyright Office's rulemakings that have taken place. Uh, and. That experience, coupled with advising literally you know, dozens of computer security researchers who contact us and small companies who contact us looking for help to try to figure out how their perfectly legitimate activities uh, can be, uh, uh, you know, can find, steer a path uh, through the dangerous waters the DMCA cre creates for them, we have a real uh, wealth of experience for how this law is actually working or perhaps to put the matter more bluntly, not working. Uh, the view basically that we have, I think it's a sensible view, is that federal regulation, federal laws should strive uh, not to do more harm than good. Sort of a basic uh, uh, test here. And unfortunately, five years under the DMCA has suggested that it is actually doing quite a bit more harm than good. So to take the latter first, is the DMCA working? Its promise was, uh, as you heard Congressman Goodlatte uh, explain, that technology companies and content vendors together uh, would be unwilling to put their content onto the digital market unless they had this assurance that the digital locks that they employed would be protected and uh, held secure. Uh, now, of course, the DMCA didn't suddenly make technological locks uh, any more or less possible or feasible content vendors have always been free to employ the locks. The change that the DMCA brought was to make it unlawful for people to bypass them or to sell or distribute tools that would allow others to bypass those locks. Uh, well, what's happened? Well, as I'm sure all of you know, the locks have not worked terribly well, nor for that matter has the law protected them. Uh, virtually every content, actually I, I won't even say virtually, every content protection technology that has been widely deployed on movies, music, video games has been broken sometimes within minutes, days of its introduction. Uh, every movie that is available in theaters today is available on the internet. So has the DMCA worked? Has it stemmed the tide of digital piracy, to use the term that uh, is so often bandied about? Well, no, it really hasn't. It hasn't stopped the pirates. In fact, it hasn't even slowed the pirates down. So the question is, OK, so it's not really doing very much good. Well, is it doing a great deal of harm? Well, as it happens, yes, it is. Uh, you have the, the costs that were described to fair use by Congressman Boucher. But the DMCA has also been used to stymie legitimate computer security research. In fact, when he was the cybersecurity czar, Richard Clark specifically said he thought the DMCA was undermining our national security insofar as it was deterring computer security researchers from doing important work for fear of being tangled up in litigation. Uh, it's also harmed competition. I think Michael will say a, a bit more about that uh, in a moment. And it has exacted a toll in fair use. Uh, and you know, you can look. Uh, products as diverse as DVDs or iTunes, the DRM there is not protecting the content in any effective manner at all. However, it is prohibiting competition, it's slowing down innovation, and it is hampering perfectly legitimate consumers who are willing and have paid for the content. They are the ones who find that they can't make the copies they need for fair use. They're the ones who find that they can't, the files disappear when they try to make a backup. There's incompatibilities between their products. That's who's really paying the price. That's why I think HR 107 is so timely and so needed. Thank you, Fred. David, um, as an attorney from the Motion Picture Association and as a former um, Department of Justice government official who knows very well um, the bad things that people are capable of, um, can you tell me why opening up the DMCA uh, in this manner would be a problem and what the result of it would be? Well, I'd actually like not to speak as a former DOJ official or as an MPAA representative, <clears throat> but also as a public interest and consumer advocate like my Fred, friend Fred. Um, I would make three points here. 
One is that we have seen a tremendous explosion of digital content being made available since 1998 in a variety of ways, and we're just at the beginning of what we're going to be seeing uh, in the near future. Number two, <clears throat> all this digital content and added flexibility is brought to you by the DMCA and the protection to content owners that it offers. And three, that H.R. 107 or uh, bills like that are wrong-minded because what they will do is open up a hole in the ship uh, ostensibly for fair use but allow the hacking for any reason whatsoever um, of these and would uh, essentially sink the incentive uh, for people to establish these kind of digital rights management and other kinds of protection of content. I mean, first, at the Motion Picture Association, we consider the DMCA stands for Digital Movies Coming Attractions. So we'd like to talk to you a little about that. I mean, it's not only happening in the future, but it's happening now. DVDs, which are protected content, um, sold $12.2 billion last year. It's a highly successful, um, consumer-friendly uh, means of watching high-quality movies. I mean, the movies aren't always high quality, but the pictures are. <laughs> um, we're going to see that eclipsed in a few years by high definition, uh, a new generation of DVDs um, that we can fit even more content on and it would be even a higher quality. You can watch them on Michael's high definition t TVs and we're all going to be very happy. But we're also very much looking forward to digital distribution of movies. You can see it now on places like Cinema Now or Movie Link. But in the future, you'll be able to go home and from the comfort of your living room, uh, either get through video on demand system or through broadband, any movie ever made. Uh, and you can watch it at a variety of ways of, of watching it um, at a variety of fair prices. This is a very exciting opportunity. I mean, and it's not that far around the corner. Internet 2 which is being deployed now at a lot of universities, and there are other experiments like that, are quickening the speed of the Internet in ways that are hardly imaginable. Right now, to take a DVD quality, uncompressed version of a movie would take on DSAL or cable approximately 25 hours. On Internet 2, it can travel halfway around the world in 30 seconds. So when that happens, this kind of at-home distribution of movies is really feasible. Some of you may have seen yesterday there was an announcement of an advanced access content system uh, that some of the movie studios are working on with a number of the technology companies that's going to allow for flexible use um, uh, through a variety of, of mechanisms so people can watch it on the new personal video recorders and et cetera. More machines that CEA can sell and better flexibility and content for consumers. Um, this is a real driver of the economy, a real bonanza, but it is brought to you by the DMCA. I mean, in 1998, a nearly unanimous Congress uh, voted uh, for the DMCA, saying that if content owners can protect their goods, consumers will benefit. Um, there was an article recently, and we've heard before, it's like banning hammers, which can be used, or crowbars, which can be used for good purposes or bad. It doesn't ban multi-purpose machines. It bans only those machines whose primary purpose is to circumvent access restrictions. And you have gotten, because of this, not only the movies, but things like iTunes. Um, all of these are protected by digital rights management, which offer flexibility, but not um, unlimited copying. 107 would put a hole in the ship. And I think that would make both EFF and um, CEA very happy. They oppose the DMCA, and I think they would just as soon uh, see it repealed. Uh, but honestly, I think that's what 107 would essentially do. It would make it legal to manufacture or distribute a product capable of en enabling significant non-infringing use of a copyrighted work. Well, there are um, there are fair uses um, that are possible in all these works. And as Representative Boucher candidly said, there's no machine out there that can tell fair use from foul. 
So if you have a machine that says, you may make copies of the DVD, but make sure you only do it to take a short excerpt and show it to your daughter's third grade class, the machine's not smart enough to know whether that's the use that you're going to make of it. And in fact, any device, um, any system that's protecting uh, a DRM or encryption that is protecting the content could be hacked under this. Uh, the, some of the advertisements, and you've, uh, there's been some have cast this as a debate of whether you can back up your movies. Um, and the Copyright Office and a number of cases have said, gee, that's not fair use. It's not a two for one, uh, buy one, get as many as you want free. But it's not the issue. There will always be ways that you could, you know, if, if these machines are legalized, <coughs> these technologies are legalized, it would be able to hack through copy protections, which would mean that there is no point in putting these content uh, on, unless will be available to the public. And so the question I would ask my friends to the left and right of me would be, what is the pressing need here? Um, do we see people out there saying, oh, I must back up my DVDs because I, you know, they, I buy them and they disappear immediately? Um, there was an article in the New York Times that said, you know, I, I want to be able to back up my DVDs because I, my winter home is in Virginia and, I mean, my summer home is in Virginia and my winter in the Caribbean and I hate carrying them all the way over there. Um, I mean, that's a heart-rending experience, but you know, <laughs> they're little guys and they're pretty tough. They don't weigh that much. Okay. So the, the question is, is, you know, why are we so ready to slaughter this goose that's laying these golden eggs and is ready to lay uh, many more if given a chance. Thank you. Uh, Michael, um, from the perspective of the Consumer Electronics Association, hardware manufacturers, et cetera. Uh, sure. You know, I mean, most of you are, are familiar with, with who we are. We represent manufacturers of TiVos and televisions, HD TVs, which I encourage you to all go out and buy, and DVD players and those things. We, we essentially represent all the fun stuff in your house. We're an intellectual property industry. We invent stuff. That's what we do. So intellectual property is very important to us, as, as important as it is to, to David's members. And, and, and commercial piracy is, is you know, a critical issue for us as well, and an issue that, that government should address. However, any law that, that, while going after commercial piracy, instead creates open liability and uncertainty or extends its reach beyond its legitimate purpose is bad. It's bad for consumers, it's bad for innovators, it's bad for creators, and, and you know, that's what we have under the DMCA. You know, the, the, the DMCA, is, as Congressman Boucher said, was a, represented a radical break in American intellectual property law. Before the DMCA, for the first 200 years, liability was always keyed to infringement. If you infringed, you were liable. What the DMCA says is that if you bypass a technical protection measure, no matter what your intent, even if it's for fair use, you're liable. And that, that is, you know, again, a, a very radical thing and a, and a very new thing. And, you know, David said that, uh, you know, we, we as CEA oppose the DMCA. I wish you were right. I got a mea culpa for you. We supported it. And since then, there has been a slew of results that were certainly unforeseen by us and also unforeseen, I believe, by the vast majority of, of the members of, of Congress who, who voted for this bill. Under the DMCA today, families are prohibited from fast-forwarding through the ads at the beginning of DVDs they bought and owned. If we built a DVD player that did nothing additionally except allowed you to fast-forward through the ads, we would be liable under the DMCA. You know, there, there's no copyright infringement, no copies being made. We're in a world where venture capitalists, because of the liability climate, uh, created by the DMCA. Venture capitalists are refusing to fund legal and innovative technologies for fear of, of, of losing under the DMCA. Competitors are using the DMCA to stifle competition in areas that have nothing to do with piracy. Makers of garage door openers and printer cartridges are getting sued. You know, for example, if you're making a generic garage door opener, kind of like a universal remote for people's garage doors, you've got to take apart the microchip in the garage door to see how it works so your garage door opener can work with it. All right? Well, that's decryption under the DMCA. Arguably, you're liable. If you're making a generic printer cartridge that's, a, that's cheap and goes into every printer, you've got to look at the microchip and take it apart in the printer just to make sure the products work. You're not stealing anybody's intellectual or violating anybody's patent or anything like that. In doing that, you're arguably liable under the DMCA. 
I mean, these these you know have nothing to do with with copyright infringement, and people are getting sued. Um, you know, and and when we're living going toward a world quickly where microchips are going to be cheap and they're going to be ubiquitous and they're going to be in everything, they're going to be in your toaster oven. Having that kind of litigation threat out there is 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 going to chill competition and give competitors that want to keep kind of cheaper options off the market a, a huge weapon as they're as they're currently doing. Um, David asked, "What's the pressing need?" That's a good question. That's a legitimate question. I, I think for us, for the technology industry, the pressing need is that right now, under today's climate, if you introduce a new device, a legal device that allows you to use media in in a, a non-commercial and flexible new way, odds are you're going to get sued, and you're going to get sued because the DMCA has created built-in incentives for lawyers to sue any suspected infringers of intellectual property without regard to intent. Um, you know, in fact, intellectual property litigation has, has it's kind of becoming the asbestos litigation for the for the digital age. For big companies, they can deal with it. For small companies, that's that's a huge issue. You know, business people are, are very risk averse, and the question they ask their general counsel before they put out a new product is not if we get sued, are we going to win? It's are we going to get sued? And if the answer is yes, they're not going to do it. So, because of the DMCA and that in that litigation climate. And, 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 and the lack of clarity, there are products that aren't getting to the market. And again, that's, that's bad for innovators and, and bad for consumers. Um, so, you know, our argument is that you go after pirates, you go after people who are, who are doing bad things, you go after people who are engaging in, in commercial piracy. But do it in a way that you're not also sweeping up all kinds of legitimate actors in our industry and, and all industries. And one way of doing that is, is reopening the DMCA and restoring that historic balance um, that existed for 200 years in copyright law. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, again, apologize for waiting on the end of the table there. It's all right. It's fine. I'm happy to go last, I guess, as the non-lawyer, because what struck me about the panelists so far is I, I, um, that you always think of lawyers as people that deal with things really accurately and that they want to really get down to the letter of the law and, you know, the, the great level of specificity. And so what I thought was really interesting are these blanket statements about the DMCA outlawing all these things, even if they're legal, when in fact there are specific exemptions in the DMCA for legal activity. So that seems like a strange way to advocate your position, to completely not discuss any of the exemptions that are in there that specifically address the legality of your actions. The second thing is a discussion of garage door openers and printer cartridges, because it should be fine to look at a, um, a microchip in order to build these generic interoperable components. Well, those are actually adjudicated court cases. So instead of saying something is arguably liable, which is something we might have done in 1998, we can actually look at the results of the court case, which again is something I thought lawyers liked to do. But so if we look at the garage door opener case, the courts in fact found in favor of the company that was building the generic garage door opener saying that maybe the DMCA, through the court system and through this adjudication, is finding the balance that its language intended it to find. We look at the printer cartridge case. That's been adjudicated as well. And it turns out they weren't trying to create something that could interoperate, but they actually copied the exact software and redistributed it themselves. And that was what was found to be liable, not the fact that they looked at the microchip. So that seems like a lot of misdirection to me coming from these lawyers that would want to be so caught up in precedent. So I guess I'm forced to ask the same question again is sort of where's the beef? I think we all agree that intellectual property is important and that we're reaching a kind of crossroads in terms of the digital distribution of intellectual property and what effect um, that's going to have on piracy. In some respects, the cost of piracy were a little bit of a counterbalance to people's incentive to pirate content and that's really decreasing. When I can get a movie in 30 seconds, or for my industry more important, a copy of Photoshop in 30 seconds, it's going to be a lot easier for the distribution of that content. And it's very easy to talk about these big companies, big companies like Philips that, that uh, Mike represents, and big companies uh, the, in the MPAA. I mean, it's easy, to, it's easy to demonize, you know, the big studios, especially after you pay eight bucks for raising Helen, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, that's easy to do. But the fact of the matter is that the software industry loses far more money than the recording industry does to piracy every year, and it's only going to get worse as these new internet and new broadband technologies, which we support, are put in place. Ambrosia Software is a very small software company, and I'll talk more during Q&A, 
that's lost a lot of money to piracy, and they don't have the mechanisms that big companies do to protect themselves. So I guess just to sum here in my five minutes and ten seconds is that uh, um, intellectual property is extremely important. It's extremely important not only to the content industry but to the software industry, if not more important. And it's very important to small businesses. The DMCA as written provides a balance. The DMCA as adjudicated has proven that balance out. Those are the actual facts. The fear and uncertainty of doubt were all arguments for five years ago, not for today. Well, in, in, before I get to my first question, and again, if you have questions, please scribble them down or be, get ready to raise your hand. Um, there's a, I'll let Mike and, and, and Fred kind of respond to a couple of questions that are on the table from their fellow panelists, which is uh, where is the pressing need and, and some of the issues that uh, Jonathan and David have brought up. Uh, Fred, Michael, particularly? Let me just say a couple of things. To respond to the question, where's the beef? There's five years of beef here. Um, and I could go through all of them. It would take more time than we have. But for those who are interested in how the DMCA has been applied and adjudicated in the last five years, something which, frankly, uh, I'd say, you know, uh, we at EFF have a considerable expertise in. Uh, we have a report called Unintended Consequences. If you type EFF Unintended Consequences into Google, it's the top hit. Uh, and you can read all of the accounts. And I won't argue to you that every single uh, account in there is a crying need for reform. Reasonable minds can differ regarding particular cases. But what you can't differ with is the fact that you have 25, 30 reported DMCA abuses reported in the press. We didn't, you know, we're, all we're doing is gathering what the press has published already. There are many more cases that we know of that we can't talk about because we're counsel or we advise them on it. But the beef is very real on this, right? You have security researchers who've been threatened with lawsuits for doing research on recording industry uh, favored uh, protection technologies. As for the garage door opener case, very interesting you should mention that because if you had gone last week to the Court of Appeals hearing here in Washington, D.C., that garage door case is far from over. As for the printer cartridge case, although the court there granted a preliminary injunction for an act of what it viewed as infringement, the DMCA claim is still in the case. It's not as though the court there said that the DMCA does not apply to this circumstance. So. It's not as though the adjudication has freed technology companies from these worries. It's not as though the adjudication has restored fair use to the consumers who are unable to do lots of perfectly legitimate things. Michael? Yeah, sure. I, you know, speaking of facts, the, the garage door opener case was actually argued before the D.C. Circuit on Friday. So it's, it's not over. It's still very much in progress. A couple of weeks ago, I was sitting on a panel like this with a poor soul heading that company, and he was saying, I don't want to give anybody access to anybody's intellectual property. I just want to give them access to their cars. <laughs> you know, so this is, you know, I, you know clearly the, the bill did not, was never intended to go after this guy. Second of all, important issue, again, you know, businesses, they're conservative. And, and they don't ask, if I get sued and we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in litigation, are we going to win? They're going to ask, does the law leave us an opening for us to get sued if we introduce this product? And if the answer is yes, that's the threshold question for them. You know, so, so whether they win in the end, I hope they do. But, but for a small company like, like Skylink, the garage door opener company, it's, it's, you know, it's very, very difficult kind of going through this massive, massive litigation. Number three, the other thing that, that uh, HR 107 does is shores up the, the, the Sony Betamax case and makes the Betamax case the law of the land. I, you know, some of you in this room probably think that somewhere in the U.S. Constitution, it says you have a right to record stuff for your own private use. Well, that's not true. The Betamax case only went to the Supreme Court after the Betamax was outlawed by the Ninth Circuit and, and essentially said the Ninth Circuit said it was an illegal product. And then Betamax was upheld by the Supreme Court by one vote. So a lot of these rights that you take for granted to do non-commercial things with your lawfully acquired media really hang by a thread. They're, they're not solid. And that's why H.R. 107 is so important. And what H.R. 107 does and what the Betamax case does by saying if it has a substantial non-infringing use, it's a legal product, they provide companies with certainty that if you move forward and you invest, you bring out this product, you're fairly safe from a lawsuit. And that's important. And it's the existence of Betamax that has allowed our industry, the technology industry, to, to explode over the last 20 years and come up with all the products you see when you go into Circuit City. So, you know, again, H.R. 107's reaffirming that Betamax is the law of the land is, is a very critical, important, uh, critically important part of that bill. 
Uh, David and Jonathan, just a few few minutes of response. Well, uh, uh, sure. I mean, n n now you sound more like a lawyer. I mean, I can give you that. No, but the. Uh, I, I think, again, the garage door opener case, what we've seen so far of it, I mean, and we can, we're can drilling into these specifics, which make it harder and harder to follow, potentially, uh, are showing that that, that it's a, wasn't a good application of DMCA. The, the Lexmark printer case was, in fact, upheld as a good application of the, of the DMCA because it was, in fact, wholesale copying of software. So, I mean, those are, those are two instances. But the, the point is these things are being adjudicated. These things are handled in the courtroom, which is specifically how the Betamax case came into being in the first place. Fair use has been defined by the courts because it's this dynamic and fluid thing that over time has granted more and more rights. The DMCA specifically, specifically, and I know nobody likes to mention it, exempts uh, legal activity from its restrictions. So yeah, you can talk, you can spread this fear about how well, nobody's going to invest in products because they don't, aren't sure. Well, nobody's ever sure, and the reality is I, I still haven't seen the product. I want to, if there's some product that isn't coming to market, I'd love to see it. The fact of the matter is legal uses are exempt. David? Let me, sure. um, let me make two points. Uh, one, I think this well, HR 107 would provide companies with certainty. It would make companies that provide hacks into copy restrictions, certainty that they won't be, uh, that they can't be sued so long as they call it fair use or, or, or advertise on the basis of, of fair use. So there's machines like, there was a, a company called One uh, Studio 321 that, or 321 that made DVD copying. There are others being sold on the internet that advertise themselves as rent, rip, and return, never buy another DVD again. Um, and that's, you know, the basis of their advertising. Again, the machine doesn't know whether you're pure in your heart or not. Uh, all it knows is whatever restrictions the technologists have put in there, it can c slice through and leave it vulnerable to being copied uh, an infinite number of times. Second, the point on information security there is an encryption research uh, exception within the DMCA, and I think you're going to find, and someone who worked in the computer crime section, you'll find a growing number of people, and I think you'll see a letter very soon from, uh, from people who are very uh, instrumental in computer security, saying HR 107 is the, th not the DMCA, is the threat, because HR 107 will legalize this hacking machines and fund them, and that presents a, uh, a danger not only to the content, but by information and privacy, which are all protected by the same kinds of digital rights management and encryption systems. So the, the jury is out on, on where our information, on whether the DMCA is threatening our information or whether it's HR 107. Well, let me ask you a question about the, um, the, the quote-unquote safety valve um, that the proponents of the DMCA have argued that the copyright process is. As I mentioned in my earlier comments, the Copyright Office can engage in a triennial review of um, exemptions to the circumvention of technological measures um, provisions. So they, they, they've come out with four rulings um, about that. Is that enough of a safety valve? Is that, is that the safety valve we're talking about? Or is it really just a trickle? David and Jonathan? I mean, I, I would say there are two safety, I mean, two parts of the safety valve. The major part of the safety valve is that we want to sell consumers, uh, consumers' products. So we're not looking to shut them out. We're not looking to make them happy, uh, to make them unhappy. We're looking to uh, make sure that we get as much of our product to them at, at, at a price that they're willing to, to pay for it that we can. But the, and I think that's a safety valve, and you've seen the market responding to this, to this need in a tremendous way. iPods, um, iTunes, a tremendous amount. Um, but the second is there is this three, uh, every three years, the Copyright Office will look at claims that, uh, that the uses are un, un, unfairly being uh, constricted by the DMCA. You brought up a case earlier where the blind were complaining that uh, that people were shutting off the ability of the computer to read that out loud. And the Copyright Office said, you're right, that is, a, that is, uh, that is an abuse and, and we'll be able to allow that. Now, there's been a lot of complaints because a lot of what they come to the Copyright Office uh, were rejected. And therefore, in the eyes of some, if you lose your claim, the umpire must be biased. 
um, but the Copyright Office has done a tremendous amount of work and very thoughtful opinions as to why something should or should not be given an exemption. And I think the process is working exactly as it should. Okay. Uh, let me give Michael a chance to respond. It is just when the, when the blind, when the, the, the group for the blind went to the Copyright Office and sought that exception, were, were your members supportive or did they oppose? I don't know if we took, I don't think we took a position on, on the, some of our best friends are blind. <laughs> My understanding is that MPAA, you know, of, of the hundreds of exceptions um, that have been, or the, the applications for exceptions that have been filed with the Copyright Office, uh, you know, my understanding is your members have not supported any of them. And that's not, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but the fact no, is, I, did, it, but, did, but we, did we oppose this? Is, is there evidence that we oppose this exception? My understanding is you did. But we can talk about that after. Uh, the experts but, but, are but, here. But uh, you know, again, I don't, I don't mean to put no. anybody on the spot, but you know, for the, for the technology industry, saying we got a process for you, you can introduce a new device, and then you get sued, and you face massive litigation by David's, me by David's members, and in three years, we'll get back to you and tell you whether or not that exception is okay. Uh, you know, for, for our industry, that, that, that is, is simply not you know, a, a functional way of, of doing business. So I, you know, I, I mean, I, I understand the exception is there, but practically for us, you know, for the technology industry, that doesn't do us a whole lot of good. Let me j just briefly, the other part of the technology industry, the people that build software that a lot of you use, are faced with another decision, which is we build software, 90% of it is pirated, and there's no avenue for getting any. The same small businesses that don't want to be in lawsuits about the DMCA don't want to be in piracy lawsuits either. And that's already an established problem in which billions of dollars are being lost, not only in the content industry, but in the software industry, paired against a kind of a theoretical issue here in which there's lawsuits that are not just going into the ether, but defining a framework for making these decisions down the, in the future. So the lawsuits surrounding the DMCA create certainty over time, whereas the absence of the DC, DMCA extenuates uncertainty and the piracy that we've already felt the effects from. Fred? What you yeah. call defining a framework, we call creating a climate of, of endless litigation for legitimate technology companies. Okay, Fred? And frankly, the DMCA isn't protecting small software vendors either. Uh, as somebody who's been involved in virtually every civil case brought, those aren't cases that are being brought by small software vendors. It's not as though the DMCA is protecting small software vendors. That's never been the case. Now, I'm highly sympathetic. Infringement is a bad thing. There are certainly uh, lots of perfectly good efforts underway to try to contain infringement. HR 107 does not approve of infringement. The, the small software vendors face piracy. It does is create an excuse for infringement. It doesn't. It, 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 it doesn't. It statutorily doesn't. creates an excuse for infringement. It doesn't do that. You can say there's some other way to use it, then it's legal. Well, if I thought the DMCA was today this great wall protecting all small software vendors, I'd be on your side. The reality is quite evidently the opposite. The DMCA is not succeeding. As for the exceptions... I see your point that it creates an environment of trepidation about creating infringing software. It protects small businesses as well as the large ones that have the funds to bring lawsuits. The absence of small businesses in the legal system, uh, it doesn't mean that the DMCA isn't protecting them. The DMCA is at most a completely illusory wall, one that I hear invoked here in Washington from time to time. But I certainly don't hear from software, small software vendors in particular, this notion that but for the DMCA, my business would collapse. In fact, quite the contrary. They feel that this law certainly is not doing them any good in what is, frankly, a much bigger problem. Now, as for the exceptions process, let me just say one quick thing. We've been involved in both rounds of the Copyright Office's rulemakings thus far. It's quite clear to anyone who pays any attention to it that the chief problem with the rulemaking exception is it doesn't have any, the Copyright Office by statute, doesn't have the power to grant any exceptions that relate to tools that allow you to make use of any exceptions that are granted. So the most that the Copyright Office can do is grant an exception that if you happen to be a, a supercomputer programmer and can program your own tools to take advantage of the exceptions they've granted, then you can use those exceptions. And that, I don't mean to run that down. There are exceptions that matter in that category. But it's sure not going to protect fair use. It's sure not going to protect the average consumer. It's sure not going to protect competition or innovation to have exceptions that won't allow anyone to, 
distribute tools. So in the copyright exemption process, what Fred, what you're saying is that you could get exemption from the Copyright Office to break uh, a technological lock. Um, however, you'd have to do it yourself because that process doesn't allow for you uh, for the manufacture and distribution of tools that would break those locks. So the blind community, how do they get access to tools that would break those locks, allowing them to do the audio reader and the text? Um, how would they get access to those tools? Do they have to track it, traffic in illegal software? That's the big question. It's not really a big question. I mean, what, what, what happens is, as a result of this, the manufacturers of the e-books are confronted with a choice. Either they can lose the DMCA protections altogether, or they can allow the read-aloud functions. And obviously, what they've chosen, for the most part, is to allow the read-along functions. So David, before the fact, um, before the fact is you're saying that they can make a marketplace choice and say, just build in the capability to read aloud or allow for text. Um, uh, That's right. And what, what explain to me what? how they lose the DMCA, because I'd love to hear this, because if this is the case, I'd like to use this in litigation soon. If you fail to enable an exception granted by the Copyright Office, you lose the protection of the DMCA. Is that what you're saying? The exception that's granted, uh, there, there is an exception. The protections of the DMCA are extended, but not to, um, not to the extent that they bar their read aloud function. As I understand it in the marketplace, what is occurring is that the, uh, the e-book companies are um, focusing on that and, and responding to both the market forces and the forces of the copyright. But as so Tim I pointed think, out, I think, it, I think it is working. As Tim pointed out, if you are a blind person and you want to take advantage of the exception granted by the Copyright Office, you have to have the computer expertise to build your own circumvention device to make that exception a reality. I think what you're doing is simply using what is now available to you on the on the electronic market. Okay. Place. I have two. I have three questions. If I can go to question and answer period, I have one in my hand, I have one here, and I have one over here, and another one over here. So let me just go to the Q and A period, if that's if that's okay. Um, the first one, and I don't want to get too bogged down in this question, um, but it's a fair one. Um, is HR HR one o one o seven? Where is it going as far as the process goes? How far how how far along is it? Um, how likely is it that Congress will reopen the DMCA in the near future? Uh, will we see the visitor center first? That type of thing. <laughs> Um, very quickly, all of you, please, your, your impressions. I'll, I'll leave it to the D.C. insiders to go first on that. Well, there's, uh, this is, there's support of, not a, of some uh, strong congressman, not only uh, Congressman Boucher, but Congressman Barton, who is, uh, was a co-sponsor of the bill, who's, who is um, head of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, what we find and what we're grateful to, uh, to you folks is the more we can educate people as to the true meaning of, uh, of what H.R. 107 would do, the more congressional uh, concern there is about this a bill and about blowing the hole into the DMCA. So we're hopeful that by process of education um, we can make sure that this uh, bill does not uh, hopefully pass the energy. Uh, committee or become law? Uh, I kind of see it from the opposite perspective, which is probably quite shocking. Um, you know, again, there are some very powerful tech-oriented members of Congress who are, who are behind it. That's great. Um, you know, other members are, are looking at the issue. It's, is, as you can tell from today's discussion, it's a complex issue. I, I guess what heartens me is that as more and more members of the, of the committee and more and more members of Congress become aware of, of these, these unintended impacts, these negative impacts under the DMCA on legitimate technology companies like my members, on consumers, on others, I, I think there is a growing consensus that, that, that the DMCA went too far. And, you know, we, we are quite confident that H.R. 107 eventually will, will pass. Uh, you know, it may be now, it may be later. But again, as, as more and more people learn about what is actually happening under the DMCA, uh, I think there will be a determination that, that this issue has to be addressed. I'm, I'm, I, I don't have Can a defer? better answer than those two okay. anyway. So. Okay. Um, I have a question here and then on to Drew Clark. Copyrights on books by, you know, using a lock uh, to train 
signals to the electric chain of, say, too short to reach the Xerox machine, <laughs> is the hammer going to be outlawed under the DMCA? <coughs> I'd love to take that because analogies are probably the most abused thing in this town, right? <laughs> and everybody chooses an analogy that best fits their needs. So obviously, let's choose a hammer, something for which it's obvious that most of the uses are non-infringing, so to speak, because a hammer could be used to break into a house. Uh, that Would that be illegal? I think a more apt analogy maybe would be like a lockpick kit, though, that for which the most substantial uses are, in fact, infringing uses. And those are really the technologies that we're all concerned about trying to block. It's not the hammer, it's the lockpick set. And that you look at it and go, oh my god, this really is for infringement. And the court cases have affirmed that, that when it's accidental infringement or when it's obviously used for interoperability, the courts are finding in favor of, of, the, of the defendants. When it's actually intentional, uh, desire to try and create, generate illegal activity, they're finding in favor of the plaintiffs. Uh, let me get Fred and then Michael. Yeah, here I'm going to uh, invoke the terrible lawyer speak uh, of which you, you, you mentioned earlier uh, and try to depart a bit from these analogies, which I think, you know, are not either of them entirely accurate. What the DMCA did, the major change in the legal regime that it created, that as Michael has described, the Betamax test is the test for most technology today with regard to copyright. If it is capable of non-infringing uses, it's okay. The DMCA flipped that rule around for circumvention devices in particular and said if your device or any component of your device can be used to circumvent, then it is potentially a circumvention device. Uh, there is a three-part test that is in... It's, I don't think it can be used. Predominantly you spoke yourself. Well, it's primary purpose. Yeah, actually, I'd love You have the blue, the blue book? Here, well, get the blue book. I, did, I didn't bring my blue book today. Yeah, we happen to have Marsha McLuhan here, so... Yeah, I'll say, your, your fine copyright office publishes our entire copyright statute for you. Get one every time it's updated. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, the, the definition essentially here is, let me just get it. Right side of page, that's right. Public. Circumvent. Well, there's a three-part test. If any portion of your technology is primarily designed or produced to circumvent, or has only limited commercial uses other than circumvention. So this would be the hammer example, right? You put out a hammer, your intent was that it not be a circumvention device, but out in the marketplace, some wily teenagers figure out that it's really good at circumvention. You can still be on the hook, even if it wasn't primarily designed. And then, of course, marketed for circumvention. Um, if you say, you know, please come here, get my uh, tool to infringe copyright wildly. Uh, so now that's a very different set of rules from the traditional copyright rule that says we focus on whether the hammer can be used for perfectly good things, and then if it's used for bad things, we go after the bad people that use it for bad things. Right? The DMCA said, well, with respect to tools that can circumvent, you can be on the hook even if it has perfectly legitimate uses. Or, again, the thing that's the most troubling is any component or part of your device. Uh, David, can, do you agree with that interpretation? No, I mean, it was a, you even saw sort of a, a poetic paraphrase there. I mean, it still has to be a, you know, the primary purpose has to be uh, to, to circumvent access restrictions. So a hammer is always going to have a huge range of purposes. Um, and a hammer is never going to be threatened by the DMCA. The lockpick is a better metaphor or there are machines like um, like some of the ones that have been barred by this where the purpose of it is to decrypt, for example, CSS, um, the content scrambling system that protects DVDs from being, uh, being stripped and sent out everywhere. So, so, Michael, Mike, let me just go to Michael and quickly. Drew has been waiting patiently. No, no, just, just very quickly. Let's, let's, you know, to, to move the description away from hammers and lockpick sets and on the products that my members theoretically might want to make. Um, the DVD player, 
that allows you to do nothing your regular DVD player does now beyond skip through the 10 minutes of ads and stuff before your DVD that you've you know, seen dozens of times and so forth. That would be one of the devices that we're talking about that would be banned under this law. And, and again, you know, that, that has nothing to do with, with piracy or infringement. Okay, I don't think any DVD has been sold in the last four years that doesn't allow you to skip through the ads, but it's a good theoretical uh, parade of horrible. Um, let, me, let me ask uh, Drew, the person that raised their hand over here has left, so uh, I think you're next up. Drew, Clark? Yeah, National Bill Secretary Daly. Uh, two years ago, Jonathan, you were on the opposite side of the MPAA on this question of um, uh, technology controls, and there's been a lot of reference to the Betamax decision, and so now that the, there's been a bill introduced in the Senate by Senator Hatch on the News Act, the formerly called the News Act, I'm wondering if um, uh, some of your members, uh, which happen to coincide also with the Business Software Alliance, which has supported that bill, uh, are in any way fearful that it could interact in unexpected ways with the DMCA as regards the Betamax precedent, or do you think that uh, it, or do you think that it's a, a helpful uh, addition to copyright law? And, and for other members of the panel, the Induce Act in particular. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the jury's still out a little bit on the Induce Act, and that's something that we're certainly looking at um, more closely. Um, and when we were on the other side of the MPAA, it, I think it was a Hollings bill that would involve basically, um, you know, putting the burden of this protection on the tech industry, and we disagreed on that point. Um, but uh, the reality is that I think we have more in common than different when it comes to the need to protect digital content, whatever that, whether that content is entertainment content or, or software. Um, so I, I, we're, we're continuing to look at the Induce Act, uh, and I mean, the, the, the reality is that we're at a time, a real crossroads in which the technology is really changing the nature of piracy, and, and we have to look at all these alternatives to see um, which make the most sense going forward. It's a balance. And I mean, fair use, the ability to, I mean, these examples that get thrown out to, to pluck at your heartstrings, like, you know, clip a movie to make it part of a book report or something like that, it really doesn't have anything to do with a machine that can make a thousand copies of a DVD. It doesn't have anything to do necessarily with perfect digital content versus pointing a camcorder at your television set or something like that. There's a balance that has to go on here that facilitates the continued creation of this content and all this fear and uncertainty and misrepresentation of the law, I think, is uh, well, going to do us all harm. Uh, not getting too much into the Deuce Act, can I have a response on the other side from the Deuce? Well, well, sure. I, you know, again, I think that's a, that's a good question, a very important question. For those of you not familiar with the Induce Act on the Senate side, it would add a new cause of action under copyright law for inducing infringement. And, and that's a very big deal. I, I think, you know, I mean, right now the power of copyright holders is as broad as it's been in American history. And today we've been talking about the DMCA. What the Induce Act does is take that and takes it a large, large step forward. Um, you know, the, the, for one thing, it would totally undercut the Betamax standard. The Betamax standard relies on an objective standard. Does it or does it not have a substantial non-infringing use? The Induce Act by making the standard intending to induce copyright makes it a very subjective standard. Um, you know, what does induce mean? If you run an ad saying rip, mix, and burn, are you inducing? If you write a product review saying the TiVo is a great product and here's how you record stuff, are you inducing? Uh, you know, again, hopefully you go to court and you find out that you're not, but just the mere fact this provides such a, a, a huge opportunity to take products and manufacturers into court, not to mention venture capitalists who give funding to these companies, who may also said to be inducing, creates a huge new liability you know, risk for our companies. Again, while, while undercutting the certainty of, uh, of Betamax. So, you know, so for the, for the technology community, this, this Induce Act is, is of, you know, major, major concern to us. David, quickly and then to uh, our just, next question. Just quickly, and I would suggest maybe uh, as we go forward, maybe a, a lunch on the Induce Act would be a, a, a fun one to do. <laughs> but the, um, uh, well, we can discuss the results, hopefully, of it uh, afterwards. Um, no, the, 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 what the Induce Act does is nothing different than is already in the aiding and abetting statute. If you aid and abet or induce someone to, uh, to, to do a criminal act, including criminal copyright, you can be held liable. 
the same is true under the patent law. And this is extending it only to people who, whose behavior is such and whose intent is such. It's intentional inducement of other people to infringe copyright. So those people who build a business model uh, on the idea that people will steal copyrighted material, um, those people do have something to fear under this. Legitimate okay. companies okay. do not. Well, uh, sorry, gentlemen, ne next question. Well, theoretically, you would be you would be uh, circumventing DSS. Uh, well, it depends on how the DVD is coded. Well, of course, the interesting response to that is the people who know best exactly how the various technologies interact seems to me are the ones who should have the burden to come forward. Since obviously we at EFF are the ones who sought the exception at the Copyright Office that would allow you to to give an exception, if there was an exception that was necessary, and again, we don't know whatever black magic is in that box, if there is anything to circumvent, we thought it fair that consumers be able to skip commercials before DVDs. Uh, and you know those movies do exist, whether or not they're common today. Uh, and the response from the Copyright Office was essentially, you know, can't have that exception because we don't have enough evidence to show that there's a circumvention going on. I wish I understood the technology well enough. I found the Motion Picture Association's uh, offering on that to be less than entirely enlightening. Uh, again, I don't know how the black magic works. For me to find out how the black magic works, I'd be potentially liable for a 1201 violation. Michael? Again, from the manufacturer perspective, let me give you another example of a product that may inadvertently run afoul of the DMCA. There is a company called Clearplay. It's a small company in Utah. They put out a product that, you know, without decrypting, allows you to hook it up to your DVD player and skip past parts in the DVD that you may find or families may find offensive, whatever that may be. Now, it may not be a big deal to, to me. I'm actually waiting for the other product that allows you to zoom in directly on it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but for millions of Americans, this is something they want to do. And it, it, it comes down to the right of people not to make a copy, not to put something up on the Internet, but to watch a DVD in the sequence they want in the privacy of their living room. Much like the Washington Post can't force you to read the metro section every day. And they are facing, again, massive litigation from Hollywood on, uh, on uh, infringement, uh, in an infringement case. Can there's, there, wait, wait, let me finish. There's legislation moving through the Judiciary Committee that would make this, ensure this is a legal product, which I, I think it certainly should be. Now, if this legislation goes through and this law passes, that's great for clear play, unless David's members decide to do a technical lockout and code their disks so that these clear play devices don't work. Then, if you're clear play and you want to enable your device to work, you're going to have to decrypt. And in decrypting, you are again going to violate the DMCA. And again, th this is a product, you're not making a copy, you're not engaging in piracy, you're watching a DVD as you want to watch it that you lawfully acquired in the privacy of your living room. And, and that's, okay. you know, so somebody's asking, you know, you, you asked, where are these products? Well, this is theoretically one of those products. David, and David, very quickly, and then. Right. The one. emphasis is on theoretically because, in fact, ClearPlay does not um, do anything to, uh, to strip the protection from DVDs. And, in fact, all ClearPlay does, I mean, what ClearPlay does is tell your machine to fast forward. There's an issue of whether that violates the derivative rights, but there has been no lawsuit whatsoever on the DMCA. The idea that the uh, that, uh, that the DVD uh, manufacturers of the movies would, uh, the, the makers of the, of the DVDs themselves, would uh, make it impossible for someone to uh, tell their DVD machine to fast forward, I think is another fanciful flight to try to come up with theoretical ideas of how the DMCA could potentially be abused and ignores the fact that though Fred calls it uh, an illusory wall. It's in a wall that people certainly seem to be screaming loudly at and one that we think, uh, we think is very helpful in protecting, uh, protecting our goods and enabling us to provide them to consumers.
I mean, just note, there are already DVDs on the market that prevent you from fast-forwarding. Mulholland Drive, Drive is one. So it's not entirely theoretical, and, you know, we'll see, because I think that'll be your next case. When clear play has, is declared legal, whether by a court or by uh, Congress, and we'll see whether studios or particular directors decide to uh, run for the cover of the DMCA to stop the American family from being able to fast forward and mute bits they don't want to see. And, and speaking of which, David, I kept trying to fast forward my Mulholland Drive DVD to the Kim Bassinger scenes, and it was very frustrating. <laughs> okay, well, let me, um, I, I think we're done on, on, on this line of questioning. Uh, any other questions? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, and if you could identify yourself, that'd be great. My members don't like to go to court. If, 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 if the liability risk is high, you don't see the product. And that's, and, they, no, and, and, and that's, that's the tragedy. The very first lawsuit ever brought under the DMCA, which was filed, I believe, a day after the law became the law of the land, was a lawsuit brought by Sony against a small software vendor uh, that made a product that allowed you to play your Sony PlayStation video games on your personal computer instead of needing to buy a PlayStation. Uh, the message went out very loud and clear that this is a law that is going to be used to stop competitors from building products that large incumbents don't want to see built. There have been other cases like that. We've discussed some of them. You don't need that many lawsuits to put that message across. And more importantly, you don't need that many letters from your general counsel to that small software company saying, if you build this product or if you continue to distribute this product, we will bury you in an avalanche of legal fees in order to get that message across. Not no, many no, no, suits, no, no, a no, great no, no, many no, no, threats. The, the, the answer is the answer is is enough to get the message across quite clearly to the technology industry. I mean, the the the, the point of these provisions, you know, is not to to take people to court. The point of these provisions is to create a, a sufficient chilling effect to discourage products that you know the copyright holders may not like, and in that it's been very successful. Uh, David, can I have you, can you comment a little bit on the chilling effects? Is the DMCA such a, uh, a strong instrument, maybe too strong, um, that it has really chilled um, a lot of innovation and would continue to chill innovation as we go forward? No, I think, you know, you see, uh, you see that there has been almost no growth in digital devices over the last six years except things like the iPod, except uh, things like the iTunes, except things like Cinema Now. Um, there is, in fact, an enormous growth, an enormous explosion in digital devices in uh, all sorts of ways to use this, to see it, that's, that's here now and in the future. And all of this, uh, you talk about chilling effect, the chilling effect would be if it was announced to the content owners, people can build hacking tools to their heart's content, um, so there's no need to try to get that stuff out there protected by DRMs. Um, that would chill innovation, that would chill the products, and you would see the, the demise of this really exciting digital revolution. On oh, chilling effects, Michael? Uh, yeah, I, you know, Silicon Valley venture capitalists have been very public about the fact that, that you know, people come to them with, with innovations and products all the time, and, you know, they, they talk to their general counsels and they do the due diligence. And, and the legal risks, you know, under the DMCA are, are higher than they're comfortable with, and they decide not to move forward. And as far as as far as the legal risks and the chilling effects, as bad as it is under the DMCA, you know, with this Induce Act in its present form, you you, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, I just want to emphasize, I guess, that that, that, that copyright legislation is it's regulation. Uh, you know, it's it's like any kind of regulation they they do on the Hill. Uh, you know, it's like Superfund. It's, it's, it's a regulation. In a regulation, you've got to have balance. And, you know, I, 
the, the, the motion picture industry is, is, is talking about how you know, tough times are due to piracy and so forth. So I just did a small bit of research before I came out in The Hollywood Reporter, which is a good industry publication. Double-digit revenue growth in the home video industry kept to, in 2003, kept major Hollywood studios afloat once again, DVD boosting video sales by 37%. Um, U.S. box office beats $1 billion record. Uh, $1 billion in June, increase of 14% uh, over June of 2003. The, these all, are, all, let me finish. These are Jonathan's, the DVDs John, that are protected wait, wait, wait. by CSS. And, and, and box office. And box office. And Jonathan's main member, who is a software provider that's probably on the vast majority of your computers, is, is, is doing fine as well. Meanwhile, I couldn't help but see the article in yesterday's Washington Post, Tech Sector Seeks Hangover Cure. Spate of earnings warnings last week from major tech companies reveals the tech industry is experiencing a lingering hangover, blah, blah, blah. And again, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I think it's great that they're successful. But, but, but my point is that, that these are not industries that are in dire need of, of urgent government regulation. And that's, that's an important thing to weigh. And, and I just want to note, just real briefly here, this just, notion just briefly, I want to the, DVDs are not brought to you thanks to the DMCA. DVDs are brought to you thanks to the free market. Thanks to the fact that they are a high value product, David's members have found ways to market them very effectively through rental, through sale, lots of different options. It's the market that protects DVDs, not CSS, as demonstrated by the fact that over a million copies of 321 Studios DVD copying software were sold in the United States in the last year. DVD copying software is available for free over the internet from literally dozens of, of websites around the world. It's, CSS was cracked by a group of teenagers, for gosh sakes. So right, let me let tell me, you, me... it's not the DMCA that brought you all these great things. It's David's members' hunger for a free market where they can make money. That'll exist whether HR 107 passes or not. All right, let me just go to Jonathan, because Jonathan was called out there. Um, just quickly in response, then we need to we wrap this up. I, I, the reality is, is the ability to protect software, and we've been going through this in software for a long time. The content has been is part of the exercise of trying to minimize the amount of piracy that takes place. Is it perfect? It's not. Do we want to?